Hi folks, happy to have you here on the AX Semantics Meetup channel. Here you will find every 14 days our latest video from our meetup where we're discussing with experts and customers about the opportunities of content automation. If you have any questions, just write it in the comments. We will answer them as soon as possible. And don't forget to subscribe our channel. Then we will see you next time here on this channel. 50 million texts generate 50 million texts per month. This sounds like a lot of content and it is. So the question arises, what the heck are they doing with all that content? Who is supposed to read that? All these are questions that are very dear to my heart. And I know from our conversation we had before this meetup, uh, I know some of the answers, but before is giving away too much or saying wrong things, I'd like to give the floor to you, Jan. You can introduce yourself, your company, and please tell us what we do together. My name is Jan Zanjo. Hi, everybody. I'm an application manager at Klingel Group. And take I take care of the project of language automation for Klingel Group. I don't know if you're familiar with that group of companies. You might have heard it from your grandmother. It's a medium-sized family-owned uh, company in the uh, dis, uh, multi distance selling. We have 15 brands that are part of our group and we operate in 12 countries. And all in all, we have more than 60 online shops, the brands and countries together. Uh, Klingel Group itself has more than 2000 members of staff. And just to give you an idea about our selling volume, we ship 100,000 uh, parcels a day, which is quite a huge amount. Who am I? I have a media production background and a copywriter background. I've always been working with text, something with media, as we used to say in the past. I also took care of the media production at Klingel and also the text page for some time. And this brought me to the topic of automation. We started a project. And we wanted to look into that matter. That was in 2016, quite a while ago. During this meetup, uh, I'd like to share a little bit about what we do on the platform. I would like to tell our, our story and our history. What steps have we taken in the context of automation? What things did we learn and what did our mistakes did we make that led us uh, into the wrong direction? So at, at first we said we're going to do something with automation and now we have approximately 50 million text that we generate per month. This is what I'm going to speak about. Uh, my presentation is divided into three parts and let's start. I'll start with my first section. That was back in 2016. We started conversations with AX Semantics. And in summer, we held the first conversations, the first meetings. And our group of companies started a pilot project in September 2016, where we wanted to look into uh, text automation, if we can use that for our products. We developed a project plan. Um, we defined a proof of concept frame. And we said we need to look and see if it will work for us because we wanted to do it in a certain period of time. We had to find out what would work. We decided for two groups of the shirts in general and the jackets. We selected the shirts because we this is a mass product. We have um, 10,000 products or we had at the time, all in all. And the product data composition was quite simply structured. If you think about a shirt, it you have different shapes, different materials, different cuts, but that's it, six, seven, eight attributes where they're different, they differ from each other. That's ideal for an automation because if you have 10,000 uh, products, you need to write texts for uh, products that are not that different in the attributes, that's a challenge. So we took the shirts and on the other hand, we took the jackets. We took the jackets because we don't have that many products, but they have many attributes that we use. 
different zippers, uh, pockets, different material properties, etc. And this is why when talking about the proof of concept, we focused on these two product groups. And in that, during the proof of concept, what you do is the following, you analyze the texts first. So we looked at the texts we had. What is our standard online text we have on our websites? What sentences do we have and what attributes? What do our copywriters write for these products? We have 100,000 products, roughly, um, we had 100,000 products at the time, in our group of companies so there were many variants regarding the text so we needed to check if that if our proof of concept would fit uh, our product range and we looked at it in detail and then we were very new regarding the topic we had to carry out a data analysis what attributes were we using what tags do we put on our um our products what attributes can we use? What will we use in the sentences? And then design and planning. So the existing data sets we had, the results of our analyses, we took all this and to plan our sentences and to have a look at the attributes. So we were looking at that. And then we were programming it using AX semantics. That was our underlying idea. We invested a period of three months for that proof of concept. We said we want to do that proof of concept in three months and we'll then decide if we want to go down that path. Interestingly enough, there was one stumbling block and a first learning during this proof of concept and that was data analysis. I've written it down here. What are the attributes and what about the values that are in the system. That was a little fuzzy because we didn't really know any precise requirements. I've brought an example. I wanted to ask you something. We looked at the different attributes. For instance, and this is my favorite example of all, we took the attribute of embroidery and just the statement embroidery on the left, on the left of the chest. How many variants can you imagine when you think about that? How many variants? Embroidery on the left-hand side. Can you think about the different variants you might have because of that? So if you thought 41, you were accurate. The others might think, what the hell? And if you have a look at the data, we had so many different product data. That's just one one example. I mean, there were many more of these examples of different statements. So we realized a content automation stands and falls with data quality. This means we can only automate well if our product data can be read by the machines. So we, we realized during the proof of concept that we needed to introduce an automation in our company, but we couldn't only focus on this automation. That wouldn't be enough. We also needed to tidy up our product data. So this is why some first findings were the following. We need as little free text as possible in the attributes. We must make sure that our attributes are following certain criteria. This means the person who enters the product needs to use the products from a pre-written list. This is the only possibility to make sure that you have attributes, the attributes that you expect, because the machine wants to have solid data. If you want to trigger a sentence with a, a trigger, you need to cup, couple the trigger to certain data, and you can only do that if you know the data you will be using. For instance, you can't uh, build a, a sentence trigger for 41 versions of embroidery on the left chest. So you need to predefine that and it needs to be unequivocal. So the attributes need to be structured in a way that they come as expected and that you can use them in the automation the way you'd expect them. This means that we realized that in addition to the text automation project, we also needed a data cleaning project. 
and this is what we started in parallel. That was our proof of concept, which was a success in itself, because what we wanted to achieve, we achieved it. Even with the quote unquote poor product data, they weren't poor, but they hadn't been optimi uh, optimized yet. And then we decided, well, one with everything, please. We said we wanted to do everything. We started in 2017 doing the following. We wanted to carry out the full automation for all the product groups in our company. The Klinger Group is a retailer with a focus on fashion, but we have many product categories in our assortment, 22 product categories, and we focus on fashion, jewelry and shoes, but there were many products we needed text for. So the first challenge was uh, establishing all the product categories. You can't put a text on a shoe with sentences you would use for a pair of pants. They don't share any attributes, that's impossible. So you really need to plan the sentences, the story types you want to build, and you need to structure that separately for the different product categories. Then there was another challenge. All the corporate languages needed to be implemented. I've shown it to you at the beginning. We have nine different languages of French also goes to Switzerland and Dutch is also used in Belgium. This means we have many different corporate languages we need to ensure. And we also thought about that in the context of automation because it makes a lot of sense if you have different languages, if automation only makes sense if you use it for different languages at the same time. And then the challenges we mentioned before, we needed to optimize our product data. So we were in constant exchange with the teams that optimize the product data because what we wanted to use for automation, we could actually use it that way. It's different than uh, a free text field. We are not that independent in the way we proceed. We also had to, had to adapt our internal processes. The processes need to be changed because we want to carry out an automation. And this is why we need the product data at a different point in time, maybe. In the past, it might have been required that some product data were only relevant for a catalog because then the product was online. And at that point, it wasn't, uh, it, it happened that you didn't have any data to write a text. So we needed to bring about interfaces. And when speaking about interfaces, I'm not only speaking about software interfaces, but also physical interfaces. Uh, contact persons for certain processes. Somebody is wearing the hat. We also need a, need a software interface to enter the data in the system to automate the processes and all that for 100,000 products, as I said before. And we wanted to invest one and a half years for that project with different milestones in between. And we said, well, one and a half years, that was our deadline. After one and a half years, we wanted to have achieved the following every product in our we have should have a text so we were quite busy really and in the context of that presentation when preparing for it i counted it and i hadn't been aware of that of the sheer extent 500 sentences is what we wrote a sentence is can consist of different variants five six seven variants 500 sentences we built 20 stories all the product groups Brand specific stories were also included. 3,500 nodes. I mentioned nodes because you might know that if you use AIC semantics from the current version, we used to work with the uh, preliminary version where they were called differently. So a node is a data processing step. That's called a node. Data comes in, something happens, and every step that's carried out is done in the analog world, and at the end, you have an output. And 250 lookup tables is what we used. For those of you who don't know it, it's a kind of an ex ex internal dictionary. You enter a term and the lookup table translates it into something that's supposed to be used in a sentence if you don't want to use the word itself. And the nodes, the stories, all this together meant that we wrote 700 
50,000 product texts in across the nine languages. I've brought an article. This is what it looks like. This is the length of the text, which was quite acceptable. After roughly one year, we said we're going to change. After this year, we said we have advanced so much in our automation process that we can change over process internally in a way that the online text is our basic text. This means we always have one text for a certain product. And the, in the past, we waited for the manual text, and then suddenly there was automation on top. We inverted it so that the automated text would be the base text for any product. So we saw a few things. We had some learnings. And what happened? Our time to market was extremely reduced. I'm sure that you know what time to market is product cycle between the beginning and the saleability of the product. And there were quite a few bottlenecks in that chain. And one was the generation of online text. Imagine it as follows. You have a copywriter and he or she produces a main catalog with new products and in parallel needs to write text for 100 products. And depending on the workload, the person does it right away or the individual postpones it. So there were some delays of a week, two weeks, four weeks, and the product couldn't go online just because the text wasn't available. And that didn't happen anymore because we were able to generate a text within 24 hours at the latest. So this bottleneck just disappeared overnight because of that changeover. Interestingly enough, the length of the text has increased, so the texts are longer thanks to automation. A text, a, a copywriter has to write 100 texts. And as this person has a lot of work to do, if that's the case, the texts are generic. With automation, you can produce a very different result. On average, we have texts that are much longer and with much more content that we can offer online. One important point was the reduction of translation costs. And that was what our uh, management liked best because we were able to cut costs. In spite of the investment that we carried out to introduce automation, not in all, we were able to reduce costs because uh, no translations, written translations needed to be done manually because you could uh, publish the text, produce the text in all the nine languages at the same time, and we needed to edit much less. So if there's a mistake in the product data, for instance, if a product was changed, the person in charge of the product changed it and automatically a new text was generated. You didn't have to click anywhere. It's all happening automatically in the background. And then there's one more point that I was accused of when we started it all. You do automation and then the copywriter says, you deprive me of my job. If the text is written automatically, I will be dismissed. But that wasn't the case because the people, people are, are afraid of new processes in general. But what happened in reality, and I can tell you after six years of having been doing automation, the people weren't um, made redundant. They had more time for creative things. That was the change. For instance, if you have a look at the um, time that you need for written translations, uh, is 70 or 80 percent of the time is for written, was for written translations, and after automation, it was reduced to five or 10 percent of the time. But the written translation of online content uh, was much more difficult. It took much longer for the translators, uh, for the newsletter, for instance, to address people in the right way, etc. So that was also a very um, interesting finding that we came up with. I said it at the outset, we're in Klingel the ones with the catalog. I spoke about online texts so far, but I'm sure that some people might remember the uh, Klingel catalog from their granny or their mother. So the catalog still is important, it's an important medium of our company, although it's becoming less important in recent years. 
So we were wondering, can't we use automation for our catalog, catalog as well? And in 2018, we also started using the print descriptions in an automated way for uh, our products in the main business field of fashion. This is not representative. I only had the rough, uh, not the very correct data. It was uh, looking more beautifully in the actual catalog. So we also um, wrote our print descriptions in an automated way. And the reduction of translations costs were also something we benefited from uh, with our catalog. So we did it in nine languages. And thanks to AX Semantics, there was a fast implementation. Because many of the things we did online, we could also use them for our printed catalog. And this was done in just a few months. We had the full rollout for our first print brand. I, th brand. I think it took six weeks to do it for the first brand, including adapting the processes. And all in all, we did it for 300,000 uh, product texts, print product texts in all the languages. And the benefit has been that we could also reduce the translation work uh, by up to 95% per double page. So you have the uh, you have the text, you have content in in the images, the price labels, the selling points, etc., and the headline and the subline, and the translation uh, process was reduced to the headline and the subline in most of the cases, in ninety five percent of the cases. And before we had a huge amount of of work producing all the text, and this is what we did in recent years. And in 2020, we started uh, planning. And then we said, we're going to do it all again. And people get really frightened. You have ramped up all that automation. Why are you going to do, doing it again? And because we realized that we had many processes and systems in our company that were old, that were obsolete. For the web shop, we had an obsolete solution our PIM, our PIM system had a core from the 80s. Uh, the programming was done with COBOL, old systems, up to lead systems. And our company said, we are going to analyze all the different processes and systems. We're going to do it all again. We're going to double check. Our, do we want to still use it? Do we want to build it ourselves? Do we want to build, to buy something new? We build a new um, PIM system, new product lifecycle management tools, etc. And those teams that worked with product data, there was a, a kind of a make-a-wish event. Every team that was working with product data was asked, what, is, what does the ideal process look like for you? And if ever you had to do with the pain points, you can imagine what I was looking uh, like uh, when asked. That is what I looked like. We're now going to do it right, finally. So there were three major findings that we had through during the years, and we changed them based on these. We changed things based on these findings. This was the previous structure we had. I'm going to show it with the mouse. We started uh, establishing a project with different categories. For instance, uh, clothing, jewelry, etc. And it was organized in a story each one. And after we used different channels with different texts, what happened was that we produced duplicates because you don't want to do twice the work. So you copy the existing data and then you have three, four, five projects with the same content or clothing, for instance. And then suddenly, we had the situation that something changed in the category. Three new attributes, two will be done away with, and you had to change it in four locations, not only in one. So the first step we took was, the first big one was, we want to turn it all around. We want to have a project per channel anymore, but per category. So now we have 22 category projects that we have started with using AX Semantics. And we control the story types for the different channels. This means the channel can be Klingel DE online or the Klingel print catalog is also one channel. This leads you to a lot uh, of synergy effects because you can bring about changes centrally at one point and the substructure 
is the same for all the output channels. This means you have a very simple management for everything. This means that every channel, every category is so unequivocal. You don't have a, a sentence that has clothing and a diamond ring. So there are hardly any cannibalization effects in that. So that was the one, the first point. We turned it all around. The second important point was that we want to have unequivocal and flat sets of data. This is a graph that reflects a data set. This was a project um, data set with a quartz shoe. They existed in two colors, black and white, and different sizes. There were more, but this is just to illustrate what I mean. This data set contained all the information for all the variants. We have the black shoe in size 36, for instance. And we then used it um, through the different channels. So we had problems using the different different attributes. It's a leather cord shoe, let's say. The black one has a paletto leather and the other one a, a smooth leather. So suddenly in your text, because you wrote one data set, and you had needed to write the text for all this, you didn't have the possibility to choose the type of leather. So it's a cord shoe for, uh, made of leather. One is palato and one is smooth leather. So we want to have flat data sets. So we did what was the following. We don't uh, enter them into a X, but on, uh, according to the, um, the product, but the SKU. We don't only put that we have court shoes in size 36, but we also differentiate the destination and the channel. So this means that the text that's uh, in AX semantics is specific, um, online specific, and we also have a channel specific data set. This means that if we want to personalize or brand specific thing, if we want to implement it using the data set, we can always tell what channel it will go to. This brings us back to the story types. As we have sorted the story types according to the channel, we can filter easily. So channel klingel.de will always have the, uh, the right text because we have a dedicated data set. And we know that before. This means you need more data sets. That's something we need to be aware of. And the third point that we also changed after many years is that we want to have bilingual data sets. We also learned that from an AX meetup with Scape Pro, I think, this is where the initial idea came from. We thought we want that too. What does that mean? It means that for every SKU that we send to AX semantics as a set of data, we always have it in two languages. We always have a German, a German attribute and the language attribute. You can see that here. The neckline always exists as a, a DE variant and in the actual variant that we are going to use. So the logic is language independent, or largely logic uh, language independent. In 98% of the cases, it's language independent. It means less work for the translators. In the countries, we have people who also use AX semantics, work with, with AX semantics. We don't commission external tra written translations, but what they can do now is focus on translating the, uh, the frame of the sentence. And correcting it and editing is it's much easier because I have the underlying logic, which is based on the German data. If there is a change, I can implement it in all the different languages and the languages are not relevant for this, so I can ignore them. So these were the three points that we implemented massively, and this had a huge impact on our efficiency. What is the current state of affairs of, auto, of the automation? We can say that out of the 22 categories I mentioned, 10 have individual text concepts. Uh, clothing, for instance, the shoes, they have a specific sentences that are organized in the different stories. And more than half doesn't have individual text, but it means for our corporation as a whole, 95% of our SKUs we have in the company do have an individual specific text. And only 5% uh, receive a generic text because they are niche products or maybe we don't have the product data we could use to do it differently. 
and they either handle the generic text or there is the copywriter that writes the text again. But in any event, a large part of our products uh, receive their text automatically. Let me give you some facts and figures at the end. This is what we have. Uh, we have 66 million unique live records or data sets on AX, a combination of an SKU with a target channel and the brand. So there are different SKUs, of course. 13 million uh, live data sets are available in German. I mean, Germany is our main market. 13 million uh, German data sets uh, in German. And this is why we come up with a famous 50 million text updates per month because we did away with the old systems we have new systems coming on and this is why there's a lot of movement and we generate up to 50 million text updates per month what's interesting from a technical point of view 50 million text updates that that's a lot of time you need for this update some weeks ago, we also carried out a performance test and looked at the maximum we can shift, we can upload. And 200 parallel requests were done in parallel, up to 200. That's a data uh, upload. Uh, that's we, we upload the data and that's uh, it ends with the handshake, if the handshake ends. So our best times is 200 milliseconds, so less than a second per request. And our performance test, we said, if we go full throttle, what happens that we asked ourselves, well, we uploaded 50 million, 55 million requests in one go, and that took two and a half days. So 55 million requests and text updates in two and a half days. That was what we were able to do with the computer. So we're talking about real big numbers here. A lot is happening, a lot is changing because, as I said before, we are changing the systems, the system properties are being finalized, the systems have been changed over, the new processes are up and running. So, but that meant a lot of change uh, also regarding product data. But it's really remarkable to see how much you can do with the computer if you want to with this machine. I'd like to thank you. This brings me to the end of my presentation and I'll be pleased to answer questions or Sime, I'm sure you also want to say something. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation to start with. I think there are questions from the audience or uh, am I mistaken? So the volume you presented is huge and I liked the moment you said that it's easily maintainable. I think that uh, maintenance, if you have such a lot of texts and data, minor changes and maintaining, all that is difficult to implement. I mean, we always have to, to speak about the whole picture. How big is your team, the team that works on automation? I'm sure you can answer that very well. Yes, indeed. We started with four people because we were new in that topic. Two uh, took care of the technical matters and two, okay, we're working in the creative field, creative texting. So we did the first project for one and a half years and with four people and then we were two people most of the time. I'm doing it together with one colleague. And it worked quite well, uh, that was us in Germany. But in the different countries, we have in-house translators. We don't have an external team or an agency that takes care of the written translations, but we have our in-house people doing the translations. And some of the translators were trained regarding AX. So we have two German speaking people and nine or slightly more in some countries, we have two or three people working in that field. So 15 all in all, but two people do most of the work. So I think that uh, if you hear the number two per, for Germany and then some colleagues uh, to do the translations, external or internal people, I think that people would have expected more people to work in that in that particular field. You can write that in the chat if you want to. Do you think it's the right team size or would you have expected more? Hey, there are some questions coming. Get ready, Jan. We're going to start. How many attributes do you have on average per category? 
per category. I'd say it depends on the category. In jewelry, uh, we have many subcategories. I think it's 60 attributes that are used in total, but it's that's due to the fact that we have many different types of jewelry, diamonds. There are seven attributes just for the diamond, the type of diamond, the uh, the cut, uh, the grade, etc. In fashion, it's 30 more or less. And this is because we have many different categories. A pair of pants has different attributes than a shirt. I'd say it's 30 to 60, depending on the category, all in all. As you said before, the cut of a diamond, if you want to describe it, you need the, the cut of the diamond and uh, a pocket of a jeans, I don't necessarily, or pocket jeans, I don't need 30 attributes to describe it. Maybe you have to break it down to the actual product. If you have a look at, a, at pens, I think it's eight attributes that you need for a, a sentence. There's a question. Uh, what is the 5% per per of text that you don't use? Uh, well, if it's a niche product, our main field is fashion and shoes. But we also have Vilsana as a brand. And they have um, um, walking aids, for instance, for elderly people. And so these are very specific products and they have specific attributes. And it's difficult to apply an automation. It's easier to write three texts instead of producing an automation uh, for a walking aid. Well, it always depends on the tissue towels. If you only renew them by new ones every 20 years, if it if it makes sense to automate it. I mean, you can automate many things, but the question is if it makes sense. Not, not everything makes sense. The 5% we mentioned, uh, well, this refers to the niche products. Four, five, six products per category we have that are very specific, that are located in a niche category, and this uh, adds up to four or five percent. How do you handle the ongoing process with the data teams? What do you do if you change a field, a data field? Uh, I'm sure this refers to the PIM team and the, to maintain the data, etc. Well, you need to differentiate a bit. In the past, in the old systems, it was different. We didn't have it in the new systems because we haven't established it yet. We did a plan how to do it. But it's going to be similar as in the past, this new process. So if a new attribute is added in pants, we don't only have the fit, but also the cut or the type of fit, etc. And usually this is communicated to our team that something new is coming and we enter it. So the updating of the product data, this is done automatically because all the data that's relevant uh, for the product group, all the attributes are exported. So this is done automatically. This means that we as a team, we only have to know that there is a new attribute coming. So this depends on the internal communication. So we know that there will be a, the fit will be added and we enter the data accordingly, the data set, and then it is adapted. Because uh, the automation is, the update is done automatically. Then there's another question, where in the workflow can we find the text generation? When does the request happen? To be more specific. What does trigger text production? Why is a text changed or generated? When does a text happen, so to speak? It's created if there's a minimum amount of attributes. In the new system of our uh, text generation workflow, it happens uh, quite early. So this means we have four or five uh, important attributes that are relevant for the text, the product name, the manufacturer, and some key points like size, etc. If we have the basic information, some first text is generated. And then it is updated because the update uh, happens as soon as there are there's more data, but the data set is generated at an early point in time. We want to have the products ready to be sold at an early point in time. And if there are some changes to the product, 
we will implement them in an automated way later on. And because the process is very fast, this update, if a new attribute is added, it takes five minutes, for instance, and then we've got the new text. It all happens very fast in the new system. Great. There's another uh, question by a viewer. What do you want to improve? So there seems to be a very high yardstick. Your demands are very high, but what else can you do? What else do you want to do? Well, as we've done everything newly, we've reached a point where the new system is ready. But there's a lot of possibility to improve. We have text in the previous system that we built with, there were some limitations. And in the new system, we reestablished the status quo. So now we are where we were before, but we have much, um, many more data. And for the texts themselves, well, we want to implement the personalization. In an optimum case, we have different types of texts for a person who accesses the page first, persons who have been there before, who have it on the watch list, uh, they are shown different texts. Uh, for instance, uh, if you had accessed a product more than once, this person doesn't need to uh, know what the product is called because they know that already, uh, etc. So they are shown different things. We also want to have a better structure. So far, we are using text blocks, but we want to have uh, paragraphs in between and after titles, and we also want to improve it according to SE search engine optimization. And we also want to tackle new things and tap new areas. We want to have automated text in a product description, a product um, description, description text that are there for the customer. So that's something different. And there are other things we can do. You can automate basically any text, and this is what we want to do in the long run. So you already mentioned three very important uh, ideas you have to improve personalization, category pages, not product pages, category pages, uh, and the readability. Uh, this is, uh, could sum it up. Are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions coming in. And we uh, have already been speaking for 45 minutes. Time flies, really. Thanks to everybody in the background uh, for support. Thanks to the audience. I hope that we'll see each other again anytime soon. Uh, stay healthy. This goes for Jan and all the others. See you and speak to you soon. Bye-bye.